I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and we actually have questions to answer today. But before we get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about this guy sitting right here. Now, those of you that have been watching our Instagram feed, Facebook feed, or even paid attention through the last episode know I have anxiously been awaiting this guy right here. This is a Panasonic Lumix GH4, and we have a 12 to 35 millimeter lens on it. And this will be replacing the camera that you are looking through right now, which is a Canon EOS 60D. Uh, now, we got a lot of questions on why we are moving away from Canon and going to Panasonic. Now, it's true, the Canon has a larger sensor. Uh, it has a great array of options for lenses and we can make a really, really fantastic picture out of what comes out of the Canon. Uh, but it's got a couple of limitations. The first, of course, being that it is only a full HD camera. I can only shoot video at full HD resolution. I cannot shoot it at 4K, which this guy will do. Uh, this camera will actually shoot internally, recording to the memory card, no external recorders necessary, a full cinema 4K picture or I can bump it down just a little bit and I can shoot in Ultra HD, which is what you see most of the time when you're looking at TVs or videos on the internet or that. So uh, when we get this up and running and get it rigged out with sound and uh, we get our lenses on here, uh, we'll be able to shoot with uh, UHD or Cinema 4K through this. Now that doesn't mean that Mail Call Mondays is gonna switch over to being a 4K optional program uh, because delivering in 4K is pretty difficult with the equipment that we have right now. Uh, it puts a real tax on our editing system uh, when we're trying to render the show in 4K. I did a couple of tests uh, and the system will do it. It will really labor through it though, so it's not something I can do quickly. Um, the second problem is uploading that 4K show. So if I shoot a 30 minute or 40 minute show in 4K and then try to upload that, uh, we are really gonna have some issues with getting it up in a timely manner and uh, getting it through and letting YouTube process it in 4K. So it's not likely that Mail Call Mondays is gonna switch to 4K anytime soon. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not gonna start pushing out some selected content, maybe shorter little things, uh, shorter little projects in 4K just to test it out. Uh, that we may do because I'm curious to see how well it will work before we start really digging in. Uh, but right now, there's just really not a whole lot of reason for that. Most of your monitors out there will not display 4K. Uh, 4K TVs are not a regular thing. Uh, when they do, obviously, we will be ready to move forward with that. But we got the camera now. Uh, we'll be upgrading our editing system probably next year sometime, and that way we'll be able to do full 4K for you guys. Uh, this leads us in to our first question of the day, and it comes from Billy. And Billy asks, the camera equipment you're coming from and the new setup, looking to get into a DSLR for match footage and don't know if I need a DSLR or a standalone video camera. Well, Billy, that's actually a question that I get pretty often when guys find out that I'm into the video stuff here. They want to do uh, short little advertisements for their products or for their company, or they want to get a presence going on YouTube, and they want to know what kind of camera because you immediately see some of the pictures and some of the uh, more artistic stuff that we've done with the DSLRs. You start thinking, wow, that's really amazing. Um, I want to be able to do that. And what you have to remember is the cameras are just simply a paintbrush. Uh, it's really the, the end image depends upon the skill of the painter. Uh, as far as what you should choose depends upon what your skill level is. Uh, it goes a lot like you know, what kind of rifle you should choose. It really depends on what you're going to be able to do. Now with DSLRs like the Canon 60D that you're looking through right now, uh, they do have the ability just to flip it to fully automatic mode and shoot in fully automatic mode with one exception. Uh, the 60Ds require you to do manual focus while you're shooting. 
and they don't have any focus assist ability. So that means you kind of have to just look at the little screen and try to make sure that you're focused really sharply while you're filming. And that can be very difficult. In fact, it's so difficult that in our T3i, I loaded another program onto it, a firmware update that actually gives me focus assist. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail on that, but I had to trick that camera out to be able to make it a little bit easier to use for me. And I still, when I'm shooting with either the 60D or the T3i, I'm shooting in full manual mode. I select the shutter speed, I select the aperture, I select the frame rate that we're shooting at, and I pull the focus on the camera uh, all on my own. So the camera doesn't do anything other than just record the images to the sensor. So really, if you are experienced enough to be able to do that, uh, then the DSLRs or the new Micro Four Thirds cameras are the way to go. Now, if you're not interested in becoming a videographer and really understanding how to do all that stuff, then I would suggest going with something more like a consumer camcorder or a GoPro to film your match footage. Uh, GoPros have a variety of settings on them and they are really a versatile little camera for what they are and they can be put in waterproof housings, they are really durable. So that can get you some really good footage without a whole lot of work. I still intermix GoPro footage with the professional stuff that we do uh, and knowing the limitations of it I can still make it work and make it look good. Uh, consumer camcorders are all over the range as far as picture quality and what your final product is going to be. Uh, if you go with some of the really cheaper handy cams that you can pick up at Walmart, uh, you're going to get okay stuff. Uh, it's going to be a little bit better than cell phone video, but it's not going to be absolutely amazing. It's not going to look like a professional video. Uh, on the top end, you can go with some of the prosumer camcorders that are going to cost you several thousand dollars that can give you a great picture. Uh, they don't give you the depth of field that our cameras will do. That gives you that blurred out background, but a really sharp uh, subject in focus. Uh, but it will still give you something that is a full HD picture and some of the new uh, prosumer camcorders or even 4K. Uh, so you can get something really good out of it and the advantage of some of those prosumer camcorders is you can flip them into full auto mode and let the camera do everything for you. That way you don't have to really learn the relationships between shutter speed and aperture and you don't have to learn how to pull focus. Uh, they won't give you as much control as some of the other options out there, uh, but it may be a better option if you're more interested in going out and shooting the match than you are being a videographer. So I hope that gives you a little bit of idea on what to go to. Uh, a lot of pro videographers are moving away from DSLRs and going towards the mirrorless Micro Four Thirds cameras. And that is why we're kind of pushing the DSLRs into a B camera role and going with this as our primary camera. Our next question comes from Daniel. And Daniel asks, Ruger Precision Rifle, will you be reviewing one? Well, Daniel, I can't tell you yes or no, we will at this point. I am working on that. Hopefully we will be able to get one into review. It looks like a really, really interesting setup for the, I believe, $1,200 to $1,400 price point on them. So I'm anxious to actually get my hands on one and see how well they function and how accurate they are from the factory. Uh, Ruger really has not been a player in the precision rifle game for a long time. So if this rifle actually uh, performs the way it is supposed to perform, uh, I think it is really going to be an exciting option for guys wanting to get into the precision rifle game. Now there are uh, really two versions that I'm looking at and that's the 308 version and the 65 Creedmoor version. What I'd like to know from you guys is uh, which version would you rather see tested? Would you rather see the 308 or would you rather see the 65 Creedmoor tested? Now because we are a little bit tactically oriented on this channel. I think the 308 version would appeal more to uh, police departments 
and law enforcement officers out there that maybe have to purchase their own precision rifle for work. But as far as the game side of it, obviously the 6.5 Creedmoor is really a better option. So I really would like to know from you guys, which one would you rather see tested, the 308 or the 6.5 Creedmoor? So leave a comment down below and let me know what you think. Our next question comes from Steve, and Steve asks, do you have any tips or tricks on someone who's left eye dominant and right handed? Other than learning to shoot left handed, is there any other options? Well, Steve, you really only have two options, and it's either change your eye or change the side you shoot from. Uh, what I would recommend is learn to shoot left-handed if you're left eye dominant. Uh, that will work out a whole lot better for you because I really prefer to shoot both eyes open uh, when I'm shooting like something like a PRS match because it allows me to identify and transition from targets faster than if I try to close one eye. If you try to shoot right-handed, with left eye dominance and you try to shoot using your right eye, you're going to have to close or patch your left eye so that it's not trying to take over the sight picture. Closing your left eye is going to increase eye strain on your right eye, which is already going to be strained trying to take over the dominant sight picture. And if you cover your eye, obviously you no longer have situational awareness out of that side of your head. So I really believe that your best option is going to be to go with that left eye dominance and shoot left-handed. Uh, that does give you a little bit of limitations on rifle setup, but not so much anymore. Uh, if you're going to have a custom rifle built, you can definitely have a custom left-handed rifle built. Uh, Accuracy International released a couple of left-handed options for you. So if you want to go with a custom rifle like that, uh, or a production rifle like the Accuracy International, you have those options. And there are a bunch of other left-handed options out there for you. So I would really recommend that you switch over, you get used to shooting left-handed, and utilize that left eye dominance because it's really gonna be difficult to train your brain uh, to rely on that right eye uh, instead of the left eye. Our next question comes from Dago, and Dago asks, an update on the AT with the Proof Research Project. Who chambered the barrel? Well, Dago, Proof actually chambered the barrel for us. They sent it to us ready to roll. So all we had to do was loosen up the cross bolt, the locking bolt on the AT, unscrew the factory barrel, screw the Proof Research barrel back on, and lock that locking bolt back down, and we were ready to go. Uh, the tolerances on the ATs are held tight enough, or most Accuracy International rifles are held tight enough uh, that you can order a barrel from a manufacturer who's set up to turn those barrels, and you can get it in and it's ready to go. Uh, we did, of course, check headspace on it, but the headspace was dead on and we didn't have any problems at all. Uh, as far as how it's doing, it is doing excellent. We just have a couple of little tests left to do before we are ready to roll with a review on it. I need to take the proof barrel out, and one of the final tests that we're going to do is we're going to heat it up. Uh, we're going to shoot a point, of aim, or a point of impact test before we get it hot. We're going to dump a magazine through it to get the barrel nice and warm, and then shoot another point of impact test. Uh, I'm confident that there's not going to be any deviation between the two, uh, but that is the main question that we've been getting on the proof barrels, is if there's any stringing or any deviation when the barrel gets hot. So hopefully we'll be able to show that on camera, and that will be the last check in the box uh, before we do the full review on that barrel. Our next question comes from Zach, and Zach asks for a 6.5 Creedmoor update. Well, the 6.5 Ma 10, we had to kind of set it aside for just a little bit because we were getting ready for the Oregon Sniper Challenge and we had to get that rifle ready to go. Uh, we also have the Collis Scope on deck right now that we're trying to get that review knocked out so that we can get that back to Collis. Uh, as soon as we get that cleared off the plate, uh, then we're going to get back on the 6.5 Creedmoor, but it is in its finished configuration, it's just a matter of going out and showing you guys what kind of accuracy it's capable of and then doing a little bit of fine tuning. So we will be getting back on that. The rifle has been performing really well and hopefully that will be the rifle that we'll be taking down to North Carolina to shoot the Guardian long range match in September. So any of you guys that are shooting the Guardian match in September, uh, we're gonna be looking forward to seeing you there. 
Next question comes from Gordon. And Gordon asks, adjusting for crosswinds, we've been shooting the range in the highlands this year out to 500 yards. The weather is unpredictable at best, and being in a valley, there are days when all the range flags can be blowing in different directions. Any guidance would be appreciated. Well, Gordon, anytime you have winds that are crossing over downrange, then you're going to have to apply some correction factors to your wind call. Uh, I usually will give the wind at the muzzle uh, the most priority, but then as I look down range, depending upon where that wind switches up, I will then come back off the wind call the opposite direction to counter for that downrange wind. Uh, and it really, there's no hard and fast rule to it. Uh, it ends up being one of those where you have to kind of look at it and finesse it a little bit. Now there are programs out there like Apply Ballistics for the iPhone uh, that will, uh, I'm sorry, Ballistic AE for the iPhone that will allow you to go through and you can set different winds at different ranges and that can kind of give you an idea of what things are doing downrange. So if you have access to the Ballistic AE program, I would suggest getting it and playing with it and you can kind of see what the ballistic model says winds at varying different range points going different directions will do to the impact of your round. Uh, but when it all is said and done, nothing beats actually getting out there and shooting in it and seeing what your different wind calls are doing versus what you decided uh, the wind was doing. Uh, if all else fails, then if you have the ability, get you some smoke grenades and uh, I don't mean military grade smoke grenades because I've realized that you guys may have a little bit of trouble getting that kind of stuff. Uh, but just regular fireworks type smoke grenades and having somebody light them off at varying different uh, spots along your range and see what the wind is actually doing with that smoke down there. And it can be really surprising when you watch when the smoke drifts up a little bit away from ground level, uh, seeing what it will do. So. Those are some options for you, but really uh, play with the ballistics programs if you can. Uh, watch what your wind is doing downrange and keep an eye on the vegetation, especially treetops. I really like watching treetops because the grass gives you an idea of what's going on right down at the bottom, but if you're shooting across a valley, your bullet may be up near treetop level. So watch those treetops and see what they're telling you. Hope that gives you a little bit of idea on how to handle those tricky wind situations. And our next question comes from Chris. Chris asks, any tips to share regarding when your eyes get tired and you still need them to be 100% for target ID and looking through a magnified optic? Also, any tips for helping to calm the nerves slash tremors? Looking forward to seeing the new camera setup up and running, love MCM. Well, Chris, thanks for watching. And as far as your eyes getting tired, uh, really what you need to do is you need to rotate off the scope. You can't sit there and burn through the scope constantly. Um, it's really tricky if you're in a situation like a law enforcement situation where you are deploying without a spotter, which happens fairly often, uh, then you really have to pick and choose when you're on scope versus when you're looking over the scope. At closer ranges, it's not as big of a deal because I can watch uh, front of a house over the top of my scope and know that if something appears that I can drop down on the scope and get a sight picture really quickly. Uh, and that will save from getting scope fatigue in my eyes. Uh, if you are shooting with a spotter or another sniper, then it's really easy for you just to share the duties and say, I need to come off, the other sniper gets on the glass, and you take a little bit of a break. But just uh, resting and not looking through the scope is about the only thing you can do to prolong how long you're gonna be able to use that razor sharp vision before your eyes just really get burnt out. As far as the jitters and nerves, uh, what I recommend is a technique called combat breathing. And it's just simply slowing your breathing down. You inhale and you hold it and then you exhale. Usually I'll inhale through the nose and I'll hold it for a three count and then exhale and just keep that cycle going and that helps bring your nerves down. It helps calm you down. It's especially effective after you just got done running to a firing point. Uh, so it's really effective just to bring that breathing down quickly. Uh, you bring your breathing down, you get focused, that will help narrow out your nerves. 
Uh, live in the moment. Don't worry about what's already happened. Don't worry about what's going to happen. Just be in the moment, uh, and that will also help lower your nerves. So hope that gives you some ideas on that. Andrew asks, what can affect muzzle velocity and hand loads? What's a normal foot per second spread in hand loads? Well, Andrew, just about anything can affect muzzle velocity in hand loads. Uh, that is one of the things that we are focusing on when we're hand loading is making everything as consistent as we possibly can. So anything from case capacity to neck tension to variances in the bullet bearing surface uh, to variances in the different powders to powder charge variations, uh, it all has an effect. Uh, you can even, even burrs on your flash hole in the case uh, can have an effect on the muzzle velocity. So we just really try to minimize it by making everything as close to the same as we possibly can. Uh, and as far as muzzle velocity and hand loads, uh, when you're under 15, I think you're going to be very good to go. Uh, now I really suggest, uh, if you can, uh, take your setup out and test some varying different extreme spreads and see uh, what accuracy you can get. Uh, one of the big things that we're trying to do when we do a load workup is we are trying to get a accuracy node where a larger spread of velocity will still impact at the same point of aim. So your load, when you're designing it, when you're doing that load workup, uh, the whole goal is to make that load resistant to changes in the muzzle velocity, small changes in the muzzle velocity. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, but just try to be as consistent as you absolutely can. Make sure you have a really good chronograph because a really uh, funky chronograph can affect your muzzle velocity as well. Obviously not the actual muzzle velocity, but what you think the muzzle velocity is. Uh, so make sure you're using a good chronograph. And if it's an optical chronograph, make sure you're using it in good lighting conditions. Our next question comes from Steven. Reliability of large frame AR slash AR10 under dirty environments, parts breakage, failures to feed, etc. Uh, well, Stephen, I don't see any difference in reliability on the large frame ARs versus the small frame ARs. Uh, we have such a wide variety of large frame ARs and AR-15s out there that the platform itself is not the deciding factor on the reliability. Uh, if they are both built to the same quality level, then you're gonna have equivalent reliability between the two. Uh, both our 16-inch Ma 10 and the 20-inch, I'm sorry, 21-inch AR-10 that I showed on the last show have been extremely, extremely reliable rifles. I really haven't had any problems with either of them. Usually, if I have any kind of issues at all, it has to do with the ammunition that I'm loading into them. Even when those things get dirty, they still perform really well because you have to remember in a large frame AR, you have a whole lot more gas to work with. So you really have a whole lot more going on. You have a heavier bolt carrier group, you have a heavier buffer. Uh, so those things also help to strip those rounds out of the magazine a whole lot more reliably. So when you're looking across the board, if they are equivalent um, quality, equivalent care has gone into building them, then you're going to get equivalent reliability out of them. I'd say a lot of times when you see these uh, unreliable ARs, uh, you're seeing something that was either slapped together with spare parts or it was put together by someone who really didn't know exactly what they were doing or the nuances of tuning those rifles, or they were just trying to get it together as cheaply as possible. So really not a whole lot of reliability difference, uh, but you can build an extremely, extremely reliable large frame AR if you take the care to do so. And our last question comes from David. David says, John, good to have you back up. My question is, does all PRS matches have pistol courses? Would like to take a trip to make a few, but don't own a pistol. Is this a requirement? Also, could you touch on shooting through Mirage past 400 yards, reticle placement on intended target? Thanks, John. Love Mondays. 
Well, David, not all PRS matches have pistol stages. They will generally let you know in the course description uh, before you sign up for it if there's going to be a pistol stage or not. If you want to shoot a PRS match that does have a pistol stage, what I would recommend you do is contact the match director and find out if they have a house gun that you can use. A lot of the PRS matches that I've been to where they have a mandatory pistol stage, they will use a house gun that's provided by a sponsor of the match or it's provided by the match director so that all the shooters are using the same handgun. Now there are some matches out there like when I shot Woody's uh, where you use your own handgun. And I prefer matches where I use my own handgun because obviously it's the gun that I train with and if there is a mechanical issue with the gun, it's my fault. Uh, nothing burns me up more than having to shoot a house gun that has mechanical issues and then I either have to do a reshoot or I end up with a poor score because of a mechanical failure on a house gun. Um, I take the time to make sure that the handguns that I use for matches and the handguns that I carry in a day-to-day -day basis are as reliable as I can make them. So I prefer to shoot my own gear when I go to those matches. But you don't have a pistol, make sure you contact the match director. Don't just discount those matches because you don't have a pistol. If you do it on a regular basis and you live in a locale where you can own a pistol, I would highly recommend that you go ahead and purchase something simple, something relatively inexpensive like a Glock 17 and 9mm and train with that. Uh, you will find that it's very easy to shoot and it will give you a one-up on those matches when you show up, even if it's one where you have to shoot a house gun. Now, a personal opinion aside, I really don't like when we go to these PRS matches and they have a pistol stage that factors into your final score for the PRS match. Uh, because there are a lot of guys that are going to PRS matches to shoot rifles and they're not really competitive pistol shooters. And I think that's kind of unfair to them to hurt their rifle score because they weren't able to shoot a pistol well. I think if the PRS matches or any of the match directors out there that are shooting rifle matches or putting together rifle matches want to do a pistol match, break it out, have it as a side match where there is a separate prize and a separate ranking for that stage and that doesn't affect your ranking in the overall rifle stages. Um, I think that is a whole lot better way to do it. I think that will prevent a lot of guys from getting upset and that will also allow guys that don't have pistols or are not pistol shooters to come and they could skip the pistol stage if they wanted to and not affect their overall score. That's just my opinion on it. The way things are set up, match directors can pretty much do whatever they want. Uh, even on PRS matches, there aren't really restrictions as far as that's concerned, uh, unless they have recently changed that. I don't think I've read what the new PRS uh, requirements are for 2015. So you can always check that out on uh, Precision Rifle Series website. As far as your second question, on Mirage past 400 yards, uh, the technique that has always worked for me in the past is when the mirage is bad enough that you're actually watching the target dance up and down, I try to determine where the target is at at its lowest point in the movement. So when it's jumping up and down, I try to figure out where that target is at the bottom. And that is the aiming point that I use to fire my round. And that has generally worked for me. And the reason that I look at it that way is the mirage is generally caused by heat waves rising. And so heat waves are pushing that target image up. And so I figure the target is probably at the lowest point. Uh, I don't have any scientific basis for that. That's just how I reason it out. And that is what's worked well for me. Uh, definitely go out and try that. See if you get more hits uh, aiming for that bottom edge, or not the bottom edge, but the bottom target image and uh, see if that works. Uh, the thing with Mirage is it's a necessary evil. There's, there's no way around it. There's really no way to combat that. Uh, you can dial your magnification back on your scope and it will lessen the appearance of Mirage, but the Mirage is still there. Uh, there's really no way to get rid of it because it is the heat waves moving the air and bending the light that's going through the air. 
So no way to stop it. Uh, you can hope that the wind comes up and blows the mirage down, but then you have to deal with the wind. So I hope that gives you an idea on that. And that is the last question that we have for this Mail Call Mondays. I hope you guys have enjoyed the show. If you have, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you guys have any questions or comments about anything, including camera gear, uh, please go ahead and leave them in the comment section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. Hopefully next week we will have the new camera set up and ready to roll. I'm still waiting on a couple of pieces for it. Uh, we have what's called a speed booster coming in that will allow us to use our Canon lenses on this camera. And we also went ahead and invested in a wireless microphone pack, so I won't have to worry about trying to sync up sound anymore. And that will hopefully also help us out uh, to increase our sound quality when we go to SHOT Show for 2016. So look forward to that stuff. And until next time, Get out and shoot!